All right, here we go. It's recording. All right, I'm going to be doing a reading, a story for you all. Um, it's one that I've always held near and dear to my heart, which is kind of weird because I've never actually read it. Uh, I've always seen the comics and the fan art, and, and I knew the story, but I never actually sat down and read it. And so this is going to be me reading it for the first time and me reading a story on my page for the first time. Like, there was that stint where I started telling that story, but the DM kind of crapped out, the game fell apart, and we only got to that one session, which kind of sucked. We had another session, but that session was such a cluster that it wasn't really fun for me. Anyways, this is the story that has caused a lot of controversy in the Warhammer 40k world, even though it is a non-canon canon story because they've even posted it in some of the new um rpg books i even i think it's in one of the only war books but anyways love can bloom by the way you'll probably be hearing a lot of my fan in the background it is freaking hot uh and so that's the point of that most of the point of the reason for that fan, uh sheet in the background is just because Dylan's playing his game and we don't want to disturb him because, you know, he pays a good chunk of the rent and this is half of his room as well. So, yeah, we're going to not we're going to put up a sheet so we can continue, I don't know, flipping us off in the background and we would have no idea. Say hi, Dylan. Hi. And flipping off from the sheets if you're worried. Oh gosh. All right. Anyway, so Love Can Blue Chapter 1 <clears throat> Exicus acta probat The outcome justifies the deed Dictum vindicare That was probably horrible Latin But that's okay <clears throat> The vindicare creed is that Enemies of the Imperium die ignoble deaths No trials for these heretics No recognition of any ability they hold Not even a record of their order to be killed A quick surgical procedure a reflexive, impassive reaction to eliminate an enemy that leaves behind only the slightest of blemishes. Soon to be hushed up and covered for fear of prompting more invisible, bureaucratic executions. Traitors and rebels may gird themselves for the unlimited waves of Garsmen crushing their towns underfoot, continent disintegrating orbital bombardments and fearless, unstoppable, merciless space marines. Yet, how they quail when oh so casually their honored leader, god figure, demagogue, idol, chosen one, noble general, great hero, nephew, friend, mother, father, child, or beloved fall lifeless, a round dark hole in their forehead. Do not fail. Most munitions that this assassin had dealt with previously have been subsonic, quiet, subtle machines that he is expected to keep hidden and assemble on sight. Other dogmas stated that all weapons had to be popular with those populations that were to be affected, to show the Emperor's judgment came from the people. And then there was the Exodus rifle. Tough enough to break a Terminator's tactical dreadnought armor, and quiet enough to not wake the baby you are using for fire brace. It is immense, huge, unwieldy, a full 1.87 meters long when fully deployed, nearly as tall as the man carrying it, wearing 8 kilograms unloaded, a full 9 kilograms loaded. One shot is all I need. By all means, Governor Militant Alexander should have dispatched a Calexus. Whatever psychic blasphemy the witch unleashed would have been stifled by the sheer terror generated by it. It was as close to a monster a human could get and still be beloved by the Imperium, only just. Lucas Alexander hated those things. That's why the Vindicare had been dispatched. That and a tangible reminder of the consequences of failure. Stand by for drop order. The sighting array switched through the spectra, finally setting on human normal. The Vindicare enjoyed these brief moments when the targets were confirmed. Eldar. Perhaps a one and two five meter tall one. Neck doesn't break easy, little bone, very flexible. The primary was having trouble with its helmet, and the Vindicare waited. A combat mission was free of the various restrictions, implications, and extenuating circumstances that were far too often glued to it. 
A swift kill was all that was necessary. Appears injured, he murmured into the mouthpiece, just in case Lucas was listening. He was a paranoid man, the Inquisition, playing both sides in the conflict between Stratis and Guard. Better to assuage the governor that he was following policy. All the better. Drop her. The commander had no appreciation for the moment, but orders were orders. His finger was on the trigger. Wait. Something's happening. I... can't. What do you mean you can't? Soldier, what's going on? Lieutenant Adrian shot a glance at the monitors across the screen, running down the various subroutines that festooned the archaic mechanicals. The tech priest checked every last one of these things for flaws in the machine spirits, so that I know there's nothing wrong with you. What is the difficulty? Silence. I say again, assassin. What is the problem? Are you under attack? Is the Eldar dead? The glow of the glass machine in front of Adrian said nothing. He sighed, and then he turned to the Vox operator next to him, currently relaying status reports on the destruction of a building to Lucas. Inform Lucas that the Vindicare is unresponsive. The officer nodded, speaking a word of prayer before entrusting it to the waves on the wind. The response was short and returning. Dispatch two chimeras, fully lo loaded. Contact the killer's handlers. Pray for forgiveness. To know the future is to look upon an ocean of possibility, twisting, turning, fast and serene at the distance. What a harmonious blue it seems ahead of you, blended together with but the vague hints of surf and wave edging and bouncing across the way. You approach it, details short to come forth, and for a moment you can see the lines of tide, the touch of the wind, rocks set in there, and aquatics going in and out of it. Now you are on the beach, and you can see the future coming at you. Then, pulling back, a hunger determined by rocks in the sky and the density of particles hundreds of miles away. You stumble over a goo vomited forth by the surf, but you can't stop walking forward. Cold. It seems to push you away at first, but then it pulls. Pulls firmly. Suddenly, the possibility and limitless potential you saw a mile back is gone, replaced by green and white and blue pulling you down into the dark. That's how this battle was. It seemed so simple, so easy at first. And then she stepped in. Suddenly she was in the middle, sucked out and away, her possibilities narrowing and tightening like water running down lungs. In the distance, screams of her kin, valuable, every one of them, more long lives dimmed and smothered by a horde of sparks, quick-lived humans. Then it was impossible. She had gone so far as to charge, for a moment, caught on the path of the warrior, all those blood-obsessed spoke so highly of. And what did she get? Stabbed through the torso for it. It was the adrenaline, the tactical necessity, her own fate, to flee. Nothing, anything but cowardice. The helmet was stifling. It had to come off. She had to breathe. It wasn't the helmet, it was the blood filling her throat. She leaned heavily on her spear, opening her mouth, spit and blood running out like a fountain that she used to know. A kilometer and a half under her, she is grinding. The tide is coming back to her. You had better give me a good reason why in the name of the throne you gave an order to move out my assassin on your own, Adrian. Lucas was angry, still injured with the high of triumph dashed upon the rocks of disappointment. He was hardly pleased. He had had to put his troops that they could not stand down yet. And the reaction has been as expected. Nineteen floggings, one execution for conspiracy to sabotage imperial morale. Sire, I have served you, I honor. Yes, from Cadia, I had trusted you. Do not dare bring up any terms of friendship. I shall have you shot for disobedience. Well, look at your condition. The Medicaid swam around Governor Militant Lucas Alexander like flies, stitching up wounds and removing broken ribs to replace with new ones. His power packs had burst. Scorching a full half of his torso, and unlike Stern, mused Adrian, Alexander tolerated the longer treatment time to heal the cosmetics. Of course, unlike Stern, Alexander was to be a governor. That, that damn witch unleashed her, her witchcraft upon me! <coughs> Lucas stuttered, <coughs> as a great dose of the pain dimmers hit him, and she got, got away! If you would just let me... What, let your retinue carry you around with a mobile med station at the ready and your shoulders distracted from securing Tyria? 
Oh, of course. I'll just invite those orcs next door to share a glass of Amzik, sire. <clears throat> I do have a commissar outside. And I know you're smart enough not to execute an honest aid. Adrian spread his hands. I was thinking of the greater campaign. Alexander sighed, nodded slowly, wincing again. Very well. I'll afford you this luxury, I must admit. He waved the untreated hand down to himself. I was hardly in any condition to act. Thank the Emperor for the... Ah, the fine medical supplies the men got from the, those Tau. Not that we need to tell anybody about this. Of course, sire. And the officios of the Assassinorum? Uh, I expect they're already here. The Elder's biology is similar to humans. They still have sweat and adrenal glands, they have pupils that dilate, lungs that draw in more oxygen in preparation of a standard fight or flight situation. What they do not have are the instincts of a human being. A human being, as was drilled into the Vindicae at the temple, when confronted by a situation of fear, will scream to alert members of its family unit, will attempt to either keep the predator in sight, or flee blindly to shelter or more family units. A sign you have done a job poorly is when the target is allowed to display the fear instinct. Typically, these instincts manifest themselves in the secondaries onlookers, targets of opportunity and the populace that one is attempting to get the message to. This is considered victory. However, when it comes to Eldar, they do not follow human instinct. The farseer in the Vindicare's sight does not scream. She draws her foot back, places both hands on her weapon, lowers her center of gravity. Sweat does not appear on her skin, rather muscles tense and relax, testing each. A moment of sensitivity in her abdominals, then release as the weight shifts once more. A gloved hand reaches up, pulls back long black hair out of her eyes. But her eyes, they do dilate. The Vindicare spy mask zooms in on the point to which he already looked, those frightened eyes focusing on a patch of dirt. Sharp metal breaks through the dust-dry dirt. The ocean is around Farseer Talder now. She drifts on the eddies, bobbing away from the hungry black below. Whether, whenever death come close, she could feel it tugging. Not the ocean tide, but something hungry instead. Fate mocked her, jeered her, pointed down there, but she had to ignore it. She put it out of mind, and the smell of Lumeras. She drifts up. Her fingers running down the wraith bone howling spear. Runes of victory, rage, calm, mensha, cane, bell, tan, rebirth, death, and the Uthua. Sliding between her fingers, she breathes in the sharp air of an alien world. One that she always loathed. But now was smelling familiarly of something. On the air was something else, rust, and the innate repulsive soulnessness of the great enemy. Her eyes flutter, pale light lifting her eyebrows, and eddy lashes over her, voices of dirt and stone and dead bones burying, saying, Here. Yeah. She draws her hair back, swallows her blood, and looks at the ground. Wicked knives sprout from the dead earth, wraith bone whistles through foreign air. Sweep and low, drag it out so as to finish it. It moves down, dips into the ground, tearing up yellow grass and slamming into the pair of hands. Pulling it up, revealing the roots of vile steel skeleton. Only half out and her spear is only half through the second hand. The first falls on the ground behind it, rolling and twitching in its search for flesh and blood. She surges forward. As the hands pull out of the edge of her blade with unnatural strength, she steps across and in the blink of an eye slams her foot into the thing's face, ramming it back into the ground, revealing the neck. A bare instant before a response was f formulated in the thing's brain. Wraithbone severs its head, sending sparks gushing. Chapter 2 Taldir had to rely upon speed. The only moment they were vulnerable, and even then was just barely, was when they came out of the ground. She might have had a chance before, but she feels her side. Blood, warm, with stray strings of meat snapped with her last exertion. And as if to remind her, pain shot through her body, sending her to her knees. She looks up. The flayed one finally uncovered, emerging from the ground, performing what she logically knows to be the static checks of the corporeum, but what for the life of her seems to be the stitches and aches of a predator reawakening. Cracks of stone lodging in the living metal echo across the valley. There was a tomb under here. There had to be. One comes closer, cocking its head. 
Insanely enough, she wonders why it hadn't already struck. Was it checking the database against traps and ruses pulled millennia ago? Verifying her against accounts of age-old enemies reserved for torture or consumption? Come on, she thought bitterly, gripping a spear. This one line of fate where I don't die. I need you to... Winsbury, four kilometers per hour. Distance, 1.6 kilometers. 6.7 centimeters. Adjust. Foreign thought. Tasted. Necron. Acid rounds recommended. Shoot the joints. She blinked, astonished, as the sun was blocked out by a raised hand. A kilometer and a half away, the slight sound that one could mistake for a finger snap was heard. Taldir raises a hand in front of her face as a bullet rams into the center of the Necron rib cage. Shards of hypersonic shrapnel nudged by fate and her mind away from her. The metallic horror's spine, set at 145 degree angle, tilts, its claw flailing at where an Eldar used to be in its fevered program, before the acid finishes what a near kil kilogram round couldn't, and it falls in half. Three flayed ones look at the horizon as another finger snaps. Governor Militant! Lucas Alexander stayed where he was, overseeing the incarnation of incineration of the Eltar corpses. The troopers clad in chem masks and biochemical armor. He turned his head slightly to see three men far apart from one another. One was leaning on an ammo dump having a smoke, the other carefully standing guard in front of an entirely unimportant building. The third was a man dressed in immaculate uniform who had conveniently forgotten any sort of identifier. Soldier? Alexander turned back to, and looked at the pit, Prometheum lapping the sides. A weak hand raised, and one of the incinerators yelled, pointing down. All five turned their main gents on the offending motion. I need to brief you, sir, the soldier blinked carefully. On the situation. Lucas nodded carefully, turning away from the bubbling hiss. And your calm? The soldier stepped far too close to the governor in the space of a moment, placing a hand on his shoulder, his pinky sliding along to the governor's keratin. My credentials are all in order, and don't bear mentioning, sire. Where and when would you like the briefing? The pinky slowly slid up to the base of the chin, following the line of the pulse. There was much the governor militant would have said. He would have laughed at the false soldier, threatening with a finger. Lucas would have loved to tell the fake all that Lucas had done in service of the Emperor Man. He would have struck the man, shot him, and ordered the other two executed. He would have. I feel we should meet immediately, alone, in my command tent, he whispered, his mouth suddenly all run dry. Thank you, Governor Alexander, the soldier murmured, removing his hand and turning on his heel. But I feel that Adrian should come. Wouldn't you say, sire? Of course, said the governor, turning, following the man, and coincidentally followed by the other two soldiers, simply minding their own business. Behind him, the smoke drove high into the sky. Now, said the man from the official assassinorium, you can be candid, he spread his hands. Forgive me, my lord, but the secrecy of our service holds utmost sway over any respect for command. Do you wish to have me flogged or denied rations? I believe these are penalties that you may inflict on me. Lucas had just sat down and paused, looking up. Pardon me, but just to our specific ranks, alas, I cannot divulge. Even within these sound-proofed walls, and before you say commander, the Inquisition had the walls soundproofed, just in case of a situation like this. Helps to assure no unfortunate leaks of confidential information. You would like to lock me up in the stocks. They have some stocks on this ship. That's a good thing your officer is unarmed, said the man turning on his heel, placing too clean and soft a hand on the governor's table. He seems the type to resist. Fortunately, my comrades are just the type to take him in with a minimum of fuss. Um, assaulting a fellow officer, my, my, what a time at the whipping post for me. The man turned a smile on his face. Who are you? My name would seem nonsense to you, I'm afraid. Actually, I should rephrase that. Names, at least in my temple, are determined by missions completed. I feel that as governor, at least in this current crisis, you may have some means to refer to me. And you would be? We'll go with Midliv. As Lucan opened his mouth, I regretfully ask you to puzzle that one out for yourself. Why are you speaking so differentially? Because I'm a loyal servant of the Emperor, and the Inquisition has instructed me to obey you. There is an Inquisitor here. He is not public, Midliv leaned in, his lips drawn taut across his too symmetrical, poreless face. 
You know this you should mention in thanks to your prayers to the Emperor. Tonight, the Vindicare. Lucas raised a hand before Midliff spoke. And just the facts, thank you very much. I'm not in the mood for your shame and self-mortification, or hints at machinations above and below. Lucas leaned in. Just tell me about the Vindicare. The two casual guardsmen entered, bearing Adrian between them. Adrian looked clearly intoxicated on Victory Amzak. Looked, Midliff continued, heedless of the new company. Ah, the Vindicare, right. Where to start? Mm, well, the obvious. He shouldn't be capable of this. Of what? Rebellion. An entirely ordinary guardsman lined themselves behind their speaker in formation. Lucas stared at the three of them as he sat back heavily, color draining from his face. Rebellion? Rebellion was something that happened to ordinary men. It was something that happened in myth to the Space Marines long, long ago. The assassins were an urban legend. They were a myth. Alexander was unaware of their existence until shortly before the invasion of Cronus. They were said to be inhuman, machines of flesh and bone and Imperium propaganda. They were ideas, they were mankind's secret monsters, held on short chains to reduce the lives as valuable ammunition. How can ammunition rebel? Necrons. They appeared recently, date of origin, areas of operation, and all invalid and untaught to the Unvindicare. The N20 coolant sheath is cool to the touch. A bad sign. Heat distends accuracy, and it should be freezing through the gloves. The finger snaps, and the kick rams into the Vindicare's shoulder. A kilometer away, Wraithbone Spear impales the already fragmented skull, and pulls down, ramming through into the torso, pulling her up. Through the scope, she glitters, she shines, she glows radiant in every spectrum he has. Range has to be shortened, concludes the Vindicare, naturally in order to increase accuracy and allow a change to the secondary weapon. Naturally. The Vindicare stands and starts moving forward his eye never leaving the scope, and the scope always seeming itself to find itself back trained onto her. The finger snaps again. Farsia Taldir's hands come apart, and together their fingers dance and sliding across the wraithbone, her eyes following the head of the blade as it slides, up and away, traces of the bitter living metal following from the body. Two down, five more to go. The tide pulls around her, leaving her untouched, where only moments before she was doomed. How? Heavy footsteps crash into and rise from barren earth as another Necron silent charges the Farsia from behind. She feels the shot through the waves before it hits. A bullet sliding through the machine's equivalent of a right thigh and ending in its left knee. She kneels, bringing the blade up into the fallen creature's neck and then pulling back to impale the one that tried to stab her with claws lost from a bullet. A human. A human was helping her. A Monkai. She could tell by the caliber of the rounds. All brute force, no understanding of the harmony of a battle. Not made to end the battle right, but to end the battle now. She couldn't be more thankful. The abomination in front of her still lived, sliding forward, scratching at the wraithbone. She stepped back, pulling her weapon free, and nearly stepped too far before she felt the fates turn down into the dark hunger and stopped in time to miss the claws of the one behind. She leaps again, soaring by her will and glance down. Three left, one of them damaged. Confidence runs up and down her as she falls back to earth, bracing herself as the pain in her side reminds her that she isn't unhurt herself. But she still feels so good. The three turn as one to face her. There's a snap. Two Necron automatically track the third's head as it flies off the already damaged neck, landing on the ground to their right. They turn back to her, waiting for something. She couldn't lose the initiative. She surges forward low and ready. The one on the left has uneven footing, and the living metal slower to adapt to the rocky landscape under it than true flesh. She steps first to the left, fate singing its assurances for the direction, then drives in, spear ahead. She sees the Necron take it. No reaction. His comrade is a blur of motion. The fates laugh as the Necron metal in her armor emit a symphony of shrieks. The Necron she impaled looks passively on, its hands reaching out and holding onto the spear as she attempts to pull it back with her one good hand. No use. She lets go, twisting, biting her lower lip as the last of her arm guard gives away, giving the slicing talons access to her untouched flesh. She pulls, her bitten lip gives blood, and her arm shrieks as pain as she falls back, injured arm held close. 
she falls backwards. The impelled Necron stares down at her spear as the metal dislodges it, slowly shaking and undulating it free. The other stares for a moment at the blood on its claws. The ragged cloth and skin held and compulsively wipes and twitches it across itself. The two turn, driving low, scuttling forward, going on either side of her. The ocean is gone. There are no tides, no eddies, no drifts anymore in the possibilities. Every single way points down. She screams. Ordinary human beings do not hold a rifle in one hand and a pistol in the other, much less a rifle designed to pound a near kilogram round across the battlefield to, if necessary, blow apart a monstrosity spawned of nightmares and the unholy vagaries of the war. The pistol was little better than a sized down version of a rifle. This is because it might break your arms. A space marine wouldn't do it because it was stupid. And the Vindicare reflected on this as he jumped over the embankment, rifle down his shoulder and pistol in his other. His eyes switched between each in the time of a blink, lining them up with the two skulls. This is going to miss, he thought. Two snaps were matched with two unbearably loud reports of metal rammed in two. Those billets weren't even going to kill them. Probably two metal skills were reduced to molten, slightly caustic and shoggy shrapnel. I'm going to go end up hurting something. He landed with a grace next to the farseer. A vindicare should not be mistaken for a human being. Contrary to a human being who is filled with distractions, memories, and connections to other, a vindicare is a well-oiled machine. He was raised and trained from birth that the only reason he wasn't dead, raped, ruined, or suffered under any other horrible abuses that we could think of was because of the Emperor. Uh, they were taught that they were selfish monsters to even think of being different from their fellows. Their vocabulary is limited to only that which they need. Any deviation is punished by torture. Uh, they were taught to hide from their teachers and administrators, and they could only come out when the mission was complete and only when they received word from an authority figure that the act they impenetrable imperial. Any deviation was punished with torture. The sense of smell is cultivated carefully. They have attempted to each let them tell the difference of weapons by the discharge of smell. Any exposure to perfume or anything pleasant and unneeded in their mission is punished by torture. Calidus requires some socialization to blend in. Calexis, with their small pool of recruits, have need to take in any they can find. Evasaur, well, their combat drags do their trick. Never shall you find any more well-disciplined than a Vindicare. So what happened to this one? We failed to finish him for a botched mission. A, a botched mission? You let him live after a botched mission? And you gave him to me after that? I am responsible for liberating a world! A one of a million, sire. I know so many people want assassins. This was one of them. An inquisitor working on a world desired to send a message to the governor. The Vindicare was supposed to take out one of the primary's personal secondaries. What? His mistress. The Inquisition added stipulations. The Vindicare finished the job, but he didn't complete all the stipulations. How do you manage to defy an Inquisitor? Well, his luck held. The Inquisitor was shortly thereafter purged before he could bring his wrath to bear, and the Inquisition informed us that they would take no action against us. Well, he did kill her, right? Well, yes. What's the matter now? He was fine earlier in the campaign. Combat stress? Machines do wear out, bearing proper maintenance. Some machines sooner than others. Does it matter? What matters is that your men out there shall not find him even with our guidance that we provided them. Are you? Oh, we are not sabotaging them. I'm just telling you that the Vindicare are trained to be a force of nature. They strike as lightning upon the heretic. They are so hard to catch as the wind, and they are as easy to find as a moat of dust in a rainforest. Mm, don't worry, though. He will be found. There's always a contingency. Ah, so that's it for the first two chapters. Uh, I still got my other videos coming up that I am just finishing. I kind of like the rawness of the videos, but if you do want me to do some editing, I got some editing software. I'm not really great at it. Uh, but anyways, so this whole story is still quite a few more chapters long, so there will be more installations. Uh, it all started with a beautiful little tiny uh, comic picture, which I'm 
going to try and link it uh, underneath in the little links down there. Heck, I might even use it or a picture or different fan art pictures has the thumbnail. Um, but anyways, thank you ever so much. This is Joe the Masks or Joseph Hitchcock. Um, you can see me on Tumblr. I s you can try to find me on Facebook, but if I don't recognize you, I won't friend you. So there's that. But anyways, uh, thank you again for listening to my channel. Uh, this was Love Can Bloom. Beautiful little story. Always love the fan art. First time reading it. So far, very happy with it. And I hope you're happy with it too. I did try to keep some of the voices and tried to keep some of the air. If you notice, there were a couple uh, mispronunciations, coughs, hacks. Eh, I'm new to this and I'll slowly get better with the way, as well as I've been sick the last couple of days. Anyways, thank you again very much so for watching my uh, YouTube channel and for listening to my show. Thank you and have a beautiful day.